Hello everyone, this is Tom Fox, and I'd like to welcome you to episode 231 of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report. The FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report is sponsored by Advanced Compliance Solutions, your one-stop shop for all things FCPA compliance related. Today we take a look at the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act enforcement action involving the German company SAP. Uh, this was a civil action brought by the Securities and Exchange Commission. I take a look at it from the perspective of the lessons to be learned from the compliance practitioner. The uh, case was so interesting, I asked Joe Orengel to take a look at it from the transaction monitoring data analysis perspective that he knows so well and we visited with about last week. So I have an insert from uh, Joe, which will uh, be towards the end of uh, this podcast podcast comes in at over 20 minutes. I hope you will enjoy it. We're also going to do something a little bit different today to start the podcast. I had a wager with a good friend of mine, Jared Morris, who is a, a avid Indiana Hoosier basketball fan. And uh, as many of you know, I went to the University of Michigan Law School, and it just so happened that happened that Michigan and Indiana played basketball last week. And Jared and I had a wager on the game, and the wager was... Whoever lost had to mention uh, the other person on their podcast. So this is my shout out to my good friend and colleague, Jared Morris. He has two podcasts that I know of. Uh, The first one and uh, most odious for any of you Michigan basketball fans out there is a fantastic podcast called The Assembly Call, where Jared uh, and some colleagues go over uh, each Indiana basketball game immediately after the game. It's a great podcast. A breakdown of basketball, and it's even more so if you like Indiana basketball. And if you're interested in podcasting at all as an art form, as a business uh, tool, or for any other reason, check out his other podcast, The Showrunner uh, Podcast. It's part of the Rainmaker Network, and he and his partner, Johnny Nestor, Nestor uh, do an excellent uh, podcast. So shout out to Jared Morris and my uh, bad wager. So with that, <clears throat> let's get right into the SAP, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act Enforcement Action. Uh, This was uh, very interesting, had a lot of interesting uh, issues. Uh, First of all was there there was actually a criminal action involved in this with uh, former SAP International, that's a subsidiary of the German companies, uh, uh, executive vice president who was uh, pled guilty to uh, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act violations for bribery and corruption in connection with contracts with the Panamanian government for software services. Uh, the individual's name was Vicente Garcia, and uh, he pled guilty last summer and was sentenced in December to 22 months incarceration for his role in the bribery scheme. Uh, we went over this uh, criminal uh, proceeding and the um, guilty plea and sentencing hearing in a podcast with Matt Ellis, podcast number 219. So I would suggest to uh, Check that out if you want a little more information on the criminal side of things. But on the civil side of things, uh, it was very interesting uh, because Mr. Garcia was, as I mentioned, the vice president of SAP International, which had the Latin American territory. Uh, The company had identified Panama as a high growth area. And from all of the information which came out in the uh, resolutions, it was pretty clear that Uh, Garcia had engaged in some pretty nefarious conduct and the internal controls process at SAP had fallen a little bit short. Mr. Garcia had uh, been very clear that he was going to engage in bribery and corruption to obtain these contracts. And at one point he attempted to uh, get a corrupt agent through the SAP uh, compliance process. And to SAP's credit, uh, they declined to approve this agent. Uh, Nevertheless, Mr. Garcia then went to a distributor, a corrupt distributor, I would note, and the distributor was given a very large discount, and with the discount, uh, I think of 18%, and with the discount, um, the distributor then billed the Panamanian government full price and paid the difference to uh, corrupt Panamanian officials for the uh, contract at issue. The... uh, SAP uh, gave back as a penalty of profit disgorgement of $3.7 million. They also paid $188,000 plus in prejudgment interest. So the um, 
the fine and penalty was relatively small, but what uh, the shows for the compliance practitioner is really the need for robustness around your internal controls and uh, continued vigilance in your compliance program because, as I indicated, Mr. Garcia had engaged in uh, corrupt acts or at least attempted to get a corrupt agent through the SAP process and then uh, was unable to do so. The Securities and Exchange Settlement Papers indicated that he lied or made other misrepresentations on the documentation around the um, distributor, but it was pretty clear that uh, given uh, Mr. Garcia's propensity for engaging in such conduct that uh, more uh, a more robust review of his actions would have been warranted. The other thing is uh, the distributor process itself. And this is something that uh, I have talked about, others have visited with me about, and I really have to point back to uh, my good friend and colleague, Bill Athenas, uh, who's a partner at Waller Lunston, Lansden, Dorch and Davis in Birmingham, Alabama, because he really had an idea that uh, I certainly hope takes hold, but I've really uh, thought uh, hit this on the head when he developed something called a distributor authorization request. And uh, simply put, it was a form which allowed a framework for business justification for a discount, which would be given to the distributor, but more than this, the business justification framework, it also uh, would assess and manage the application going forward. So uh, you've got the documentation around what's your business justification, and then you manage that relationship going forward. And as anyone knows, the most important and most difficult part of any third-party relationship is after the contract signed. But you need to try to figure out uh, what are the particulars of a particular discount request and what are the reasons uh, that it should or shouldn't be granted? Uh, because the specifics of something like a, a distributor authorization or a re request are critical, they should be cross-referenced or cross-checked uh, in addition to the original uh, request. So it's uh, not clear, but uh, it certainly looks like Mr. Garcia, the corrupt SAP International employee, had a, a wide discretion wide amount of discretion and a lot of authority uh, to uh, complete these forms, provide information, and unfortunately it wasn't really double-checked in a way uh, that provided a meaningful uh, internal control over uh, the sale. So uh, one of the other key areas was there was a large or rather a group of individuals uh, distributors, agents, and others around this transaction. These were not identified in either the Garcia criminal action settlement documents or the SAP settlement documents. They were given code names by the government, so that may mean additional indictments or enforcement actions are coming down the pike. Nevertheless, when you have such a number of individuals around one transaction, I think that that pretty clearly points up some red flags that should be uh, considered and uh, this was apparently not done by uh, SAP. Uh, so with that, I'm going to end this part one, and we're going to move to part two of this podcast, where Joe Orengel talks to us about the transaction monitoring uh, component of internal controls and how that might have helped uh, SAP in a situation like this. As I promised, I had a have a special segment uh, for this podcast. I asked my good friend and colleague Joe Orngell, co-managing director of Visual Risk IQ, if he could share some of his his thoughts about the transaction monitoring component that was listed in the SEC cease and desist order. Uh, I found it very interesting that uh, SAP did that, uh, and and perhaps if I could describe it, Joe, they basically they said uh, that after they discovered the fraud of Mr. Garcia, they went back and took a look at the sales profit margins for all of Latin America. And that got me thinking back to some of our discussions over the prior week where you walked us through how data analytics can be a part of a best practices compliance program. And it seemed to me to be a, a pretty strong shout out as to the power of that tool and certainly 
how well the SEC thought of it. So I wanted to, to put the question to you. How would you think through setting up a transaction monitoring program to look at something like profit margins to see if they're out of line and then maybe take another step as putting your auditor hat on to see if, uh, if that uh, was the basis to fund a pot of money for a bribe? Sure. Well, um, in reading the the uh, the enforcement action, Tom, I guess there's there's two elements of data analytics and um, and transaction monitoring that come to mind. First is the the notion that Garcia used an existing uh, distributor who had already been approved for the suspect transaction. So kudos to SA, SAP for having a strong vetting process to reject the the um, the new um, the new distributor the new the new channel partner um, but the the use of existing um, business relationships to perpetrate um, this sort of a, this sort of an action really shows the importance of not just doing a one-time check on the front end, but doing some sort of repeating analysis and comparing your existing distributors to individuals that may be on a hot list or may otherwise um, have have issues um, around them. Um, two, two thoughts there. One, certainly comparing a list of current distributors to a list of watch list third parties, that's something that um, continual monitoring, continuous monitoring uh, can do. And if your organization has a good vetting process on initial approval and then doesn't do anything on a periodic basis, there's a, a clear takeaway there. The, the second and I think more important takeaway um, is a, a control that, that shows that the, the approval controls at the, at the vendor or channel partner level are only part of an effective internal control structure. There needs to be analytics at the transaction level, at the contract level in this case, to look at the discount levels as provided to, um, to SAP's channel partner. We have, uh, have seen visual analytics tools such as Tableau or ClickView be very helpful in comparing discounts from uh, customer to customer or channel partner to channel partner to look at, um, at discounts, compute a normal range, and when extraordinary discounts are offered to customers, that is the, uh, the opportunity to, to really interrogate and make sure the approvals are there. So the, um, so you identified a party, ongoing party monitoring, and then you moved uh, to transaction monitoring. Uh, could I ask you now if uh, maybe you could put your auditing hat on? And uh, either I or, or someone from the compliance office has, has come to, to you and said, Joe, we've looked at, uh, run all of our transactions in Latin America, and we've identified five that uh, we think need further review. How would someone who has the ability uh, to take a deeper dive into those transactions um, look at both the uh, efficacy of those transactions, but also try to make sure that no pots of money were uh, generated, which were used to fund a bribe. Well, sure, and, and this this is establishing that that range of of discounts that are um, considered normal or extraordinary. If I remember the the dollar amounts right, this is a a fourteen million dollar contract that had a uh, three point seven million dollar. Um, contract. I'm not familiar with the ins and outs of what a, a normal discount is at SAP for a, uh, a $14 million transaction, but it appears that the, um, the $14.5 million was a, a list price or a, a contract price, and um, the $3.7 million was a, a discount that the customer ultimately did not get the benefit from. Instead, the, the benefit 
um, accrued in that, that pot of money. Um, what we would suggest to do to identify these circumstances on a go-forward basis would be to monitor each contract and I would expect that there's a, a normal um, a normal discount. That is, very few folks uh, go up to the, the auto dealer these days and look at the price of the sticker on the vehicle and pay that price. And certainly if they're buying $14 million worth of fleet vehicles, um, the chances of them paying the sticker price is even more unusual. So you would expect some modest discount, whether that's single digits or teens or even 20s, probably uh, depends on your business. But you would expect to see some sort of a minimum um, discount level for a contract of this size. And then there would be some sort of a maximum discount level for a contract of, of that same size. And then you're comparing each of your transactions to that normal range and your extraordinary range. And when you've got uh, transactions that are in the extraordinary range is either too high or too low, um, that's when you want to bring in additional diligence to that effort. The diligence can be communicating with the end customer. The diligence can be communi communicating with all people on the sales team, including the, the final individual that provided the, uh, the authorization um, for the transaction. In Garcia's case, as a, a VP at SAP, it's clear that he had um, pretty significant ability from a sign-off level, but I suspect he doesn't have the ability to put $3.7 million worth of um, uh, goods on an accounts payable invoice and approve all of those. Uh, that's certainly going to be below his uh, his authority at a company like SAP. So just as he would need to go one up for approval for a purchase of that size, in effect, that $3.7 million discount ought to require additional approval, someone in finance or even yet compliance, depending on how extraordinary that discount is compared to um, other contracts, same size, similar region, similar similar customers around the country. The uh, the one of the things that kind of intrigued me, and certainly as you described it, Joe, was thinking through an appropriate segregation of duties. And I certainly understand that at at a at a VP level in any corporation, you're going to have a large amount of uh, authority to to uh, or dollar amounts that you can approve contracts. But perhaps would the, could a segregation of duties be to disconnect the approval of the distributor discount rate from the ability to approve a contract or have some other way to put a second set of eyes on the entire, the entire transaction? Well, I, I know for, for contracts that I've seen that uh, have this, this sort of uh, uh, dollar value to them, they're always my friends in, in legal that are involved in, in that sort of approval. So it it does seem yeah, but like we don't the, get to we don't get to say yes or no on the amounts. You, you don't get to say yes or no on the business terms, but the business terms ought to be approved by by someone in finance. Um, so the business terms are this um, you know twenty or thirty percent uh, discount, and um, having other people at the organization talk to the the end customer. Um, whether it's checking in on the, the implementation team or other um, quality control type, um, type procedures, I think it's, it's certainly a, a reasonable thing to expect approvals from finance on the discount amount, um, a, an independent approval by legal for uh, any changes in the terms and conditions, and to verify that the customer has received um, all of the products at the, the price agreed to on the contract, it's reasonable to, um, to expect some sort of independent contact between a, a quality function and the, uh, the end customer. I think had SAP had some of those additional controls that I've described in place, 
they would have had a much better chance of ident identifying this rogue employee um, without ever having the, uh, the bribe be paid. And I would just add that uh, always, always, always secure audit rights from your distributors. Uh, makes things a lot easier if you got them. Indeed. Indeed. Well, Joe, thanks for these insights, and I uh, look forward to visiting with you again on any further uh, or rather future enforcement actions that uh, may lend themselves to a trans transaction monitoring analysis. By all means. Thank you so much, Tom. Have a great day. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report. If you have any questions about this episode, you can certainly contact me at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. I'm developing my next mailbag episode, so if you have any questions, please send them in. I also hope you enjoyed the uh, short uh, insert with uh, Joe Orengale talking about transaction monitoring. And once again, let me give a shout out to my good friend uh, Jared Morris uh, for the Assembly Paul Call podcast as well as the Showrunner podcast. This is Tom Fox. Thank you very much for listening and look forward to visiting with you again.